So how do we start to see friends and neighbors as friends and neighbors, even if we're just meeting them? Um, well, I think that directly uh, relates to the work that I do. I'll go inside a building in, in our catchment area, Flatbush area, and um, I'll just talk to people. And, I, and you'll realize that the problems that the um, older Caribbean or minority tenants are experiencing are the same problems that the newer, you know, white tenants are experiencing or the newer other ethnicities are experiencing. And once we found that common ground, there was less of a uh, uh, looking at each other as enemies. They realize you're all tenants in the same building and all neighbors. So once you take a collective stand, it's way easier for us to put pressure on their their owner that they both share, they both have the same <laughs> landlord, to um, put pressure to, to do the repairs, to stop the harassment. Um, you know, we get more information about the building to find out if it, if, if they're slowly, illegally deregulating the apartments within the, apart, uh, within the building. So I think the first step for just everyday people on the ground is to just don't look at, you know, the new people coming in as your enemy because they're going to be subject to the same problems you are. They're most likely being overcharged. Whatever repair issues you're having in the building and whatever harassment you're having, they most likely will have that same problem because the landlord, uh, the people, the developers, they don't, they don't, they're not looking at it like we want white people in the neighborhood. They're looking at it like we want money and we want to exploit everyone we can to get more money. So, you know, it's like you just come together, make a collective stand yeah. against the problem, and that's, that's where you can start. I see you, Neil. I, I think you, I agree with you and I don't agree with you. I think you're right that they want money and that's the bottom line. I think, you know, one of the things we're dancing around here is the issue of race, and I think wanting white people is all about wanting money, you know? I mean, you see it in neighborhood after neighborhood, right? The, there's like this succession pattern of, of, uh, of waves of people. First, you have the folks who move there when nobody else wanted to live there, right? Which is mostly usually people of color and immigrants. Yeah. Um, then you have the artists, right? <laughs> the folks who will live anywhere as long as it's cheap. And it. they're perfectly fine living with people who, you know, in a neighborhood with people who may not look like them. And then you have the people who say, hey, wow, that neighborhood's really cool. There's a bunch of white artists there. That, I, I feel comfortable there, you know, the sort of, and then come the people who say, oh, wow, look, you know, I feel totally fine. You know, that's not a, you know, neighborhood of color or dangerous or something like that. That's some place where I'm gonna see a lot of people who look like me and each stage, right? So I feel like the first step is for, for potential gentrifiers, which is all of those people except yeah. for the first one, is to be aware of where you are in the process, right? And to say, okay, you know, it's something I face, right? You know, I'm sort of a middle class white person living in Brooklyn. I have been pushed out of neighborhoods and I have gone into other neighborhoods and probably rented apartments that other people then couldn't afford because I was paying more. Right. And you have to be aware of it and you have to be willing to say, okay, what can, you know, how can we sort of all work together on this? But it's hard, you know? Yeah, I would agree to disagree because I think that that may be how it originally appeared, like, and that may be how it was at one point in time, but the mm. lines are getting skewed. Like, as the councilman said, he's, you know, a black man who became successful, came back into <coughs> his neighborhood, and now he's the gentrifier. So I think that the lines are getting skewed because, number one, it's happening so rapidly, gentrifying. And you don't know you don't know who's walking around anymore. Mm. You can't you can't look at a neighborhood and say that's a typically black neighborhood anymore. You, you just can't do that because the lines are becoming so skewed and it's becoming so gentrified so rapidly that neighborhoods that were predominantly white and black is like it's just like a, a melting pot of mix now. You, okay. It just doesn't look the same anymore. But what I would argue is that if he grew up in that neighborhood and now he comes back and stays, he's not a gentrifier. He's is a product of a, of a policy that we should be pursuing. And, it, and, and, and I think that one of the big antidotes to gentrification is if we really invest in our community so that they grow socially and economically and politically and powerfully. Yeah. It, it, we really have to begin to do that rather than have a strategy that says the city renews itself by replacing the people who are there. How do we develop the programs? I'm not arguing with you. I'm just building well, on what uh, you're saying. How do we build the programs that allow them to develop to the point where they are the next middle income population so that people aren't trapped in poverty, but you can actually grow a community so that it can grow economically and politically. 